Well, <clears throat> welcome everybody. We're pleased to begin our event today. I am Shanti Kalethal. I'm director of the International Forum for Democratic Studies here at the National Endowment for Democracy. And I'm very pleased to welcome everybody to today's presentation, The Dictator's Endgame, Explaining Military Behavior in Nonviolent Anti-Incumbent Mass Protests, featuring Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellow Aurel Croissant. Funded by the US Congress, the Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellows Program hosts some of the world's most dedicated democracy activists, scholars, and journalists to conduct independent research and pursue projects here at NED. Now in its 17th year, the program has hosted more than 260 fellows from over 90 countries since its founding in 2001. Within this remarkable group, our speaker today stands out for his committed scholarship on civil military relations and democracy. So let's turn to dictators, which is the topic of note at the moment. Dictators live dangerously. Historically, the most frequent threat to a dictator's political survival comes from regime insiders. In recent decades, however, threats from nonviolent mass mobilizations have increased sharply. In a dictator's endgame, when peaceful mass protests overwhelm a regime's security forces, the ability to maintain the loyalty of the military is key to a dictator's survival. When dictators lean on military support, however, they may find that the generals refuse to obey their orders. Even prior to the Arab uprisings, the success or failure of dozens of popular uprisings were contingent upon the loyalty of the troops. If military allegiance plays such a crucial role, what factors explain a military's decision to support or abandon a dictatorship? In his presentation today, Aurel will explore explanations for the varying outcomes of dictators' endgames in the period from 1946 to 2014, and examine how military decisions impact post-revolt regime dynamics. He will conclude with lessons learned and thoughts on the implications of his research for democratic governments and democracy advocates. Uh, I think many of you may have seen uh, Dr. Croissant's biography, so I won't go through the whole thing, but um, he is a professor of political science at Heidelberg University in Germany, where his research focuses on democratization, authoritarianism, civil-military relations, and Asian politics. He has published over 200 articles, book chapters, monographs, and edited volumes, and has served as co-editor of the journal Democratization, and serves on the editorial board of the Asian Journal of Political Science and the Journal of Contemporary Southeast Asian Affairs. Uh, if you are interested, Orel and I actually sat down to discuss various aspects of this topic, and you can find this forum Q&A on the NED website at ned.org. So in case today's presentation doesn't answer all of your questions, there's additional information and context to be found there. We will now turn the floor over to Orel, who will speak for approximately 30 minutes. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NED events, or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at NED Democracy. If you haven't already done so, please do take a moment to silence your cell phones, and let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved with this event, most especially research associate Jenny Barker, who offered vital assistance to the fellowship project and today's presentation. Thank you very much, Shanti, for this very generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon again. Thank you for coming. Before I start my talk, I would like to thank the National Endowment for Democracy for providing me with the opportunity to present some of my work on the military and authoritarianism. I would also like to thank everyone involved in organizing this event and especially involved in the selection process that led to my Reagan for Self Fellowship. I may add, I think that was an ex excellent choice you've made. But on to the business at hand. As Shanti already remarked upon, autocrats, dictators, live dangerously. Although their average tenor is higher than that of democratically elected leaders, the risk that they will be swept out of office in an irregular way is much greater. While some authoritarian leaders exit office in a 
predictable and institutionalized way, as in communist regimes such as China or Vietnam. Many more are deposed by a coup, forced out of office by mass uprising, are overthrown because of foreign intervention, left office due to a civil war, or were just assassinated. Some recent examples include Robert Mugabe, deposed by a military coup in November this year, just a few weeks ago. Tunisia's president, Ben Ali, who was forced out of office by mass protests in January 2011. President Saddam Hussein of Iraq, removed from power by external intervention in 2003. And Laurent Desiré Kabila, then president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, who was shot by his own bodyguard in 2001. The loss of office itself is also dangerous for dictators. In terms of post-tenure fates for autocrats, since 1946, almost half of them were imprisoned, executed, assassinated, or fled their countries after losing office. Nicolae Ceausescu, here with his wife, the last communist leader of Romania, was executed by soldiers after a quick show trial in December 1989. Benito Mussolini, Italy's Il Duce, who had been forced to resign by his own fascist Grand Council in 1943, or Libya's revolutionary leader, Muhammad Gaddafi, in 2011, were both killed by rebels. Filipino President Ferdinand Marcos fled to Hawaii, which is, by the way, one of the most popular exile destinations for former dictators, together with Paris and Riyadh. Chunda Wan, who had sized power in 1979 and who was president of South Korea in the 1980s, was sentenced to death in 1996. Perhaps Robert Mugabe cut a good deal this year compared to many of his peers around the world. Historically speaking, the most frequent threat to an autocrat's rule comes from regime insiders. The military coup d'etat is the most common form of insider deposal by coup. Robert Mugabe is just a recent example. In contrast, historically mass protests and mass revolts have rarely forced dictators from power. However, in the past three decades, a very different picture has emerged as the relative predominance of leader exits precipitated by the masses has sharply increased from 3% in the 1970s to 14% in the 2000s, whereas the number of coup d'etats declined from 57% of all irregular dictator exits in the 1960s to just 8% in the 2000s. With the rise of these nonviolent, anti-incumbent mass protests, or democratic revolutions, people power movements, or color revolutions, many studies have attempted to analyze the origins and outcomes of these mass protests, demanding regime change, but not necessarily achieving it. While explanations differ, there is one common finding. The ability of a dictator to keep his military loyal is a key factor for the outcome of the revolt. Most dictators do not rely on the military for day-to-day -day control of the population. Rather, they task other agencies of internal security with repression of the political opposition. In Tunisia, for example, the police, not the military, was the key pillar of Ben Ali's internal security apparatus. South Korean dictators used the Korean Central Intelligence Agency and the riot police to disrupt anti-government activities. And in Ceausescu's Romania, the infamous Securitate, one of the most brutal secret police forces in the world, was responsible for the arrests torture, and death of thousands of people. 
Yet, when a dictator is confronted with widespread mass mobilization, such agencies of regime security may be overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the protests. The military then becomes the ultimate guardian for the dictator's political survival. However, when dictators turn to their armed forces to defend them against the masses on the streets, they often find that military leaders refuse to obey such orders. Examples include President Marcos of the Philippines in 1986, Slobodan Milosevic of Serbia in 2000, and Ben Ali in Tunisia in 2011. Furthermore, not only do militaries' responses vary widely, some armed forces defend the dictator, as in China in June 1989, and in Syria and Bahrain in 2011. Others defect from the regime, as in the Philippines in 86 and in Tunisia in 2011. And some militaries take the opportunity to put themselves in power in Egypt in 2011. But the outcomes of nonviolent mass protests also display a great deal of variation in terms of actual leader and regime changes. In the Philippines and in Tunisia, military defection was crucial for democratic transitions. In China and Burma, military repression stabilized the authoritarian regime. And in Egypt in 2011 and in South Korea in 1980, the military response ushered new dictators into office. If military loyalty plays such a critical role, as I claim it does, and since the manner in which autocrats exit office affects the political trajectories of countries once the autocrat has been deposed, what explains whether military leaders attempt to defend a dictator or, in contrast, openly flout political orders? How can the differences between military defection by organizing a coup d'etat and shifting loyalty to the opposition be explained? The rest of my presentation examines these questions. In this, I will present arguments and findings from an ongoing collaborative research at Heidelberg University, Germany, in which we have collected and analyzed data for 40 episodes of what we call the dictator's endgame in the period from 1946 to 2014. However, I think I should first define what I mean by a dictator's endgame. The existing research, I would argue, suffers from a lack of conceptual clarity. Instead, it addresses a wide spectrum of different phenomena that range from government crisis and nonviolent mass protests to military coups, armed insurgencies, and civil wars, and that conflate protests against democratically elected and authoritarian governments. In contrast, the term dictator's endgame describes a situation in which a dictator's survival in office is challenged by sizable popular uprisings that take the form of organized and primarily peaceful street demonstrations. Dictator can be one person, usually a man. There's only Lady Macbeth. That's the only female dictator I know of. And uh, uh, Mugabe's wife was close, but uh, failed, obviously. Uh, it can be one person, or it can be a group of people, like a central committee, or it can be uh, uh, any other form of collective leadership. While the dictator desperately tries to cling to power by dispersing the crowds, police and other internal security troops either remain in the background or are called out, but are overwhelmed as the demonstrations swell. Dictators must then rely on the military forces to subdue the uprising. 
I should emphasize two points. First, in principle, both authoritarian and democratic leaders can be challenged by mass protests. My definition, however, focuses on authoritarian regimes because there is, I think, a systematic difference between dictatorships and democracies when it comes to mass protests. Dictatorships, in contrast to democracies, inherently lack an independent authority with the power to enforce agreements among key political actors. And in authoritarian regimes, in contrast to democracies, violence is never off the table. Second, this research focuses on instances of predominantly nonviolent mass mobilization. Because existing studies demonstrate that there is a systematic difference in military reactions depending on whether the opposition applies tactics of armed struggle, to which the military usually responds with repression, or if the opposition primarily employs civil campaign techniques. So I'm focusing only on authoritarian regimes and on peaceful mass mobilization, primarily peaceful mass mobilization. With regard to military behavior in such dictators' endgames, we can differentiate between three different outcomes, military reactions. Scenario one is repression, red. The military applies large-scale violence against the protesters to put down the mass, un the mass unrest. Scenario two is the loyalty shift. The military refuses to put down the protests, either by staying quartered, they just remain in the barracks, or by joining the opposition. And that's blue here. And uh, scenario three is the military coup d'etat, green. The military attempts to unseat the dictator and to take over the government, at least temporarily. Overall, my fellow researchers and I have identified and examined 40 dictators' endgames in the period 1946 to 2014. Of these 14, 40 endgames, 19 or 48 percent resulted in military repression. For example, China in 89, Myanmar in 2007, Syria in 2011. In the remaining endgames, Six or 18 percent experienced a military coup, for example, Egypt in 2011 or Burkina Faso in 2014. And in 15 cases, 37 percent, the military shifted loyalty from the dictator to the opposition. For example, the Philippines, East Germany, Serbia, or Tunisia. While not historically a new phenomenon, four out of five endgames we examined, that is 80%, took place after 1980. And nearly one in three occurred since the turn of the century. Furthermore, we find endgames in most regions of the world but they are particularly frequent in East and South Asia, post-communist Europe, and the Middle East and Northern Africa, although the later is, of course, primarily due to the Arab uprisings since 2010. It is also the Middle East and North Africa and in Asia Pacific where nonviolent revolutions face the highest probability of military repression something that has also been recently noted in conflict studies. And in the q and I can, of course, elaborate on some potential explanations for that. These descriptive findings call for explanation. Researchers have addressed military responses to dictators' endgames from a variety of analytical perspectives and research traditions, including civil-military relations, contentious politics, conflict studies, and of course, democratization studies. Existing arguments can be grouped into two strands, a rationalist strand and a ideational strand. 
The rationalist arguments explain military behavior based on the interests of the military institution or military leaders, exempli gratia political or material dissatisfaction, the preservation of the military as institution, and its internal cohesion. These include military internal variables such as the existence of military commercial or business interests, legacies of human rights violations by the military, and the existence of intramilitary conflicts. In addition, scholars who examine military behavior discuss a series of characteristics of autocratic regimes, such as the cohesion of the ruling elite coalition, the robustness of the non-military security sector, and the mechanisms of authoritarian coup proving. Ideational approaches explain the outcome of dictators' endgames by referencing to ideational or normative factors. Some authors stress the importance of the military's normative self-conception and professionalism. If the military primarily conceives of itself as the guardian of the government, the regime, or as having responsibility not to the government but to the people. Others highlight the military's formal or informal mission. For example, if militaries conceive of internal security and regime security as an appropriate role for themselves, and whether the military collectively internalized norms of human rights protection, for example, as a result of international military education and training programs. While not fundamentally disagreeing with these two strands of existing scholarship, I argue that military organizations are unitary and rationalist actors. This is, of course, a well-established but heroic assumption. Even though military reactions to mass mobilizations are shaped by a complex concurrence of different factors, the dictator's survival ultimately depends on his ability to present the option of staying loyal as the most profitable choice to the military. Whether militaries defect from the dictator or if they remain loyal, depends, we argue, mainly on the combination of these four causal factors. First factor, strategies a dictator uses to maintain his control over the military. Second, the social diversity of the protest movement and the social distance between movement and armed forces. Third, the extent to which military leaders are involved in human rights violations prior to the end game. And fourth, the extent to which the cohesion of the military as organization is undermined by factionalism and intramilitary conflicts. I will briefly elaborate on each of these four causal factors and illustrate what they look in reality. The following table illustrates our finding for six of 40 cases. It's just for illustration. The way of illustration is necessarily stylized, and I'm happy to provide more detail in the Q&A if need be. The method we use to test the possible relationship between the four factors and military reactions is called a process observation using our original qualitative data set on 40 dictators' endgames. The coding of the outcomes and the variables is based on in-depth case studies. In other words, we did 40 case studies. Well, to be frank, 37 or so, because we are not done with all 40 cases yet. And we used a variety of primary and secondary sources, archival research, and in some cases, expert interviews. The first factor is a dictator's control strategies vis-a-vis -vis the military. The instrument used by a dictator to control the armed forces affect the military's behavior in an endgame because if the controls closely tie the military's leader's survival 
to the dictator's political survival, military leaders have little choice but to defend the dictator against the protesters. As highlighted by a number of authors, the promotion of military officers based on their common regional, ethnic, religious, or family ties with a dictator is more likely to ensure military loyalty than other strategies because it isolates the military leadership from the ranks and the broader society. We call this strategy ascriptive selection. Let me provide some examples for illustration. In Syria, the Assad family filled the senior ranks of the military and especially sensitive command posts with relatives, members of the same religious group and other religious minorities and natives from the same region within Syria as the Assad family. In South Korea, dictator General Pak Chun Hee during the 1970s had favored a certain group of cadets from the Korean Military Academy, members of the so-called Hana He, we are one faction, who were almost exclusively natives of the northeastern Yongnam region, including Busan and Daegu, also the home region of dictators Pak Chun Hee and Chun De Wan. General Tan Shui, chairman of the military junta in Myanmar in 2007, had filled all sensitive positions in army and military intelligence with personal loyalists. In contrast, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt had not been able to infiltrate the military with personal loyalists or members of a particular ethnic, religious, or regional group. The second factor is the key features of the mass movement, the protest movement. On the one hand, a broad and socially diverse movement increases the potential costs of repression, especially if the social distance between military and movement is small. Cracking down on such movements raises the threat of a breakdown of military discipline, which would undermine the military's leadership's interests in maintaining cohesion of the organization. In contrast, the costs of repression are lower if the social composition of the protest movement sharply differs from that of the military. If the demonstrations are dominated by a particular social group, students, member of a particular political party or an ethnic group, the protests can be depicted as illegitimate illegitimate demands of notorious troublemakers, which reduces the costs of repression. Again, some illustration might be advised. In Burma in 1988, the protests were broad and diverse, but there was virtually no contact of, uh, or relationship whatsoever between the military and the opposition movement. So the protests were diverse, but the social distance between the military and the protest movement and between military leaders and opposition leaders was extremely wide. Again, in 2007, the protests were mostly organized and led by Buddhist Sangha, Buddhist monks, but not joined by the broader population. The protests in South Korea in 1980, which ended in the famous or notorious Gwangju massacre, were carried out by leftists, leftist students and illegal worker unions as well as by citizens from the southwestern Honam region, whereas the military crack troops that put down the protests were mostly from the southeast, from the Yongnam region. In Bahrain, during the Arab uprisings, the protests were primarily carried and supported by the Shiite community, while the Military consisted mainly of members of the Sunni community, often from other countries like Jordan, Egypt, Syria, or Pakistan. In Syria, a minorized senior officer corps and crack troops were ordered to put down protests organized mainly by the marginalized and disadvantaged Sunni majority. In contrast, the mass protests in South Korea in 87 
took place in all regions, not only in the southwestern Hanam region, were cross-sectional and very much supported by the urban middle classes. The same applies to the people power protests against President Marcos in 1986, which were not only supported by the middle classes and social activists, but also by business groups, for example, the Makati Business Club and the Catholic Church. Ironically, the only significant opposition force that did not join the protests were the communists. The third factor is whether military leaders and the military as organization must fear that it might be held accountable for wrongdoings under the authoritarian government if the mass movement brings the dictator down. Military leaders who can be confident that they will not share the dictator's fate are more likely to defect, to save their skin, and support the protests. Consequently, a military that was not or only marginally involved in human rights violations, torture, and internal regime security is more likely to defect from the dictator. For example, the Tunisian army, this group, this bunch of poor guys underprivileged compared to the police and intelligence service, 20, 26,000 conscripts who did pretty much nothing else than sitting in their barracks. Or the communist armies in Eastern Europe, which were not engaged in regime security. In contrast to the militaries in Syria and Myanmar, which are responsible for widespread crimes against humanity, human rights violations. Finally, the previous three conditions, a script of selection, diversity, and distance with regard to mass movement and military atrocities, these three conditions affect the military's leadership's expected benefits from repressing the protests or shifting their loyalty to the opposition. Successful military coups, so the difference between uh, shifting loyalty to the opposition and staging a military coup, however, can be explained especially with regard to the fourth factor, military unity. Successful military coup plotting requires a high degree of coordination. That's why so many coups fail. Examples, the Philippines seven coups in five years all failed. One of the main problems was coordination. Moreover, military leaders must be willing to crush resistance, which requires an effective hierarchy and internal command structure. In fact, our analysis of these 40 episodes of dictator endgames suggests that in all six cases that experienced a military coup, military unity made the difference. Does it matter? Does it matter for post-endgame political developments whether the military switches uh, loyalty, shifts loyalty to the opposition or stages a coup? In terms of military responses, we find that it does matter. We find that loyalty shifts usually result in leader exits within one year. There's a very high chance for a leader exit in an authoritarian regime within 12 months if the military shifts loyalty from the regime to the opposition. In contrast, military coups always lead to leader exit. Yet crackdown is no guarantee for a secure tenor for the autocrat. In 12 of the 19 cases in which military leaders decided to suppress the protest movement, the dictator was nevertheless deposed from office within 12 months, mostly because of pressure from inside the regime coalition and shifting patterns of political allegiance and power. For example, during the Mac, uh, Black May protests in Thailand in May 1992, hundreds of thousands of Bangkokians demonstrated against the government of General Sushinda. The military crackdown resulted in at least 52 deaths, many disappearances, hundreds of injuries, and over 3,500 arrests. Despite military repression, 
So Shinda was forced to step down as prime minister. This is the guy in the, in the black suit. Uh, when the royal palace intervened. And of course, uh, the, right, uh, the picture on the right side is uh, Shah Reza Pahlavi in 1979, who had to flee Iran despite the fact that the imperial army tried to suppress the protests. Loyalty shifts have a good record in producing transitions to democracy within three years. Crackdowns, even if the leader exits later, often do not initiate transitions to democracies, to democracy, and military coups during anti-incumbent mass protests also rarely lead to transitions to democracy within the first three years following the endgame. Egypt's development after 2011 is a typical example. The idea that a military coup during these nonviolent protests opens a window for sustainable democratization is simply not supported by empirical evidence. What are the policy implications? My last point. Nonviolent revolts and revolutions have significant political consequences and can obviously dramatically impact the international security environment, no matter what the outcome is. For example, the revolutions that have unfolded across the Middle East and North Africa over the last several years have impacted American and Western interests in terms of the security of Israel and the spread of democracy. Likewise, earlier revolutions in Eastern Europe and the Asia Pacific have had profound implications for global security generally and for US security specifically. Even when civil protests fail to remove a dictator or do not achieve their goal of democratic regime change, they may have profound consequences on intra-regime dynamics, political military relations in the affected countries, and possibly on the domestic politics of neighboring countries and whole regions. While I'm skeptical, skeptical regarding the ability of social scientists to forecast mass revolts and nonviolent revolution, I think that's all nonsense, and I have concerns about overgeneralization from a limited number of cases and empirical observations, I do think that with a sufficient in-depth knowledge about the specific form of each of the four factors I just described in individual countries, it would be possible to make a highly educated guess about the army's response to a revolution or popular uprising. I do not claim that this tells us when a popular uprising is likely to occur. Clearly it does not. But only the probable responses of the military. Accepting the premise that these factors can be accurately assessed, how useful as a practical matter are they to policymakers who want to influence the course of nonviolent revolutions? I think there are at least six implications. Five are implications, and one is more or less uh, advertising my own explanatory framework. So first, Western governments, those Western governments who share the assumption that supporting democratization is still a legitimate and useful tool of foreign and security policy, may want to re-examine their cooperation with authoritarian regimes, in particular in the field of military-to-military -military cooperation, military assistance, security sector reform, or international military education and training and determine whether they can promote conditions that increase, increase the chance for loyalty shifts. Second, the framework presented here could be used to evaluate possible military reactions to nonviolent mass protests before such protests actually happen. This could reduce the risk of being surprised by actual events and might help to develop a toolkit for policy measures through which external actors might try to influence military 
and opposition behavior. Third, as remarked upon before, social distance between opposition and military seems to be an especially important factor. Hence, one helpful tool might be to facilitate dialogue and contact between military elites and civil society and opposition activists before the actual protests start. One more policy implication is to encourage militaries after a coup to return to civilian rule and don't buy into the military's rationale for a democratizing coup, so-called good coups. Good coups often lead to bad results in terms of democratic governance. Fifth, one could rethink support for countries in which loyalty shifts take place, investing especially in those countries in military security sector reform where the military shifted its allegiance and loyalty from the regime to the opposition. And six, and that's not a policy implication, but an outlook to tomorrow's event on uh, Chinese and Russian sharp power. Of course, one of the problems for Western governments who try to um, influence the relationship between military and civilian elites or those conditions that may f lead to um, uh, uh, loyalty shifts is, of course, China's rising sharp power. One example is Cambodia, which, where the government just canceled exercises with the US and Australia. That makes it more difficult for uh, Western governments to influence, to take influence in military affairs, or Thailand, which has shifted since 2014 its reliance on Western uh, arms imports uh, to China and is now engaging in a very uh, close military-to-military -military cooperation with China. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Aurel, for a very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. I found myself having to take notes on many aspects of it, um, and I have many questions myself. Um, but I know we probably have many questions coming from the group here. So um, let me just uh, kick it off with um, at least one question. We recently sat down to discuss the specific case of Zimbabwe. And I know that Zimbabwe does not necessarily fall within the cases that you have studied precisely because there was no popular uh, movement beforehand. Um, but what, do your, what does your research tell us about um, the likelihood of a prospective democratic transition there um, following what's happened in the recent past? Well, yes, Zimbabwe is not a scenario included in this research project, but fortunately, I'm also interested in military coups and uh, civil military relations and authoritarian regimes in general. So uh, I mentioned Robert Mugabe and Zimbabwe uh, uh, several times in my presentation because this is the typical case of leader change, leader exit in an authoritarian regime. Through an insider coup orchestrated and organized by the military leaders, most certainly in cooperation with party elites, a certain faction within the party. So that's the typical pattern, typical, the, mo the, the most typical mode of leader exit we know in authoritarian regimes, in insider coup. Well, Zimbabwe, of course, now is a case that is, uh, I find uh, rather surprising that there was a coup because uh, that was the first coup in the history of Zimbabwe since 1980. And uh, uh, another finding from uh, our own research is not only that authoritarian leaders have to fear their own colleagues more than the masses or external democratic powers when it comes to survive in the office, uh, it's also that coups breed coups. Coups lead to new coups. That is, most of the military coups after World War II happened in countries that for one or other reason had a coup very early. 
They do usually not happen in countries' military coups, like Zimbabwe, which never had a coup in the past 30 years. What does that mean? That means probably that the military, and especially because there's also in Zimbabwe a fairly strong regime party, that the military will not be able or will not be willing to institutionalize some form of military rule, but will return to the barracks and remain a key player in the authoritarian order, but not institutionalizing a military regime in Zimbabwe. And I, you know, one thing that occurred to me as I was looking at your very interesting chart is, as you say, you're very wary about providing any sort of prescriptive or predictive um, type of policy recommendations here. But do you find evidence that dictators themselves are learning from these patterns? So, for instance, looking at your chart, I would conclude if I were a dictator that wanted to stay in power that I would... Um, coup proof, in other words, put my interests within the military, that I would ensure that there was a, um, uh, a, that the mass movement would somehow not be representative of my own interests, and that uh, the military would also be quite used to committing atrocities and perhaps riven by internal faction. Do you find evidence that dictators are actually learning that these are conditions that might help keep them in power? And conversely, do you see evidence that opposition movements are learning the opposite lessons and actually doing what you suggested, for instance, perhaps making more connections to the military elite in the run-up to any sort of action? Well, let me formulate two hypotheses for which I have empirical, anecdotal evidence, but not robust statistical results. Uh, so the first hypothesis, dictators are like soldiers. They, learn, they always prepare to fight the last war, but they never prepare for the next war. That means in this context, yes, author, authoritarian leaders, dictators, seem to try to emulate or copy or replicate coup-proving strategies, for example, that they see in other countries. So coup, certain types of coup-proving strategies, coup-proving means just a dictator tries to prove his rule against the risk of a coup. So uh, what, what uh, dictators often do, especially in the Near and Middle East, not so much in Latin America because those were military regimes, uh, they do this counterbalancing thing, which means they establish a number of paramilitary units or special military units, like the Fourth Armored Division in Syria, which are separated from the military chain of command. That's a brilliant idea if you want to prove your rule against the risk of a military coup. It's not very uh, helpful or efficient if you face mass uprise, mass protests. Actually, that seems to be one of the lessons we can, if we want to advise support dictators, we could uh, provide the lesson that different challenges require different forms of of uh, coup-proofing strategies. And so, for example, you have this in the, in the Middle East, you see that in, in the Near and Middle East, dictators in the nine, from the 1970s on, where possible, try to, try to begin to start with this uh, uh, counterbalancing strategy. Uh, while in Asia, often what you uh, see is, uh, in fact, efforts to strengthen military unit and combine it with ascriptive selection. Ascriptive selection, however, I mean, these dictators, they, they, they may want to learn, but of course they do not act in a social, historical, uh, economic, and political vacuum. So to employ a certain ascriptive selection strategy, there must be some kind of minority you can rely upon, right? Religious minority, regional groups, ethnic minorities. That's not necessarily a very uh, promising strategy for a military regime in Latin America, where you don't have these conflicts, regional, ethnic, at least you didn't have them in the past, uh, which you could instrumentalize or politicize in order to uh, use a script of selection. With regard to opposition movement, yes, that, that's exactly what you see uh, in these uh, protests uh, in the past 15 or 20 years, so around 2000. Uh, like in Serbia, where uh, opposition leaders, protest activists try to contact military officers, try to uh, establish relations with military officers, sometimes successfully, sometimes 
unsuccessfully, uh, and relying on nonviolent civic protest techniques. I, I'm not so sure if this finding in conflict studies that civic resistance is more effective than violent resistance really holds as a general rule. But what seems clear, as soon as the opposition starts to engage in violent protest techniques, arming themselves, storming the barracks, that will trigger a military reaction. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, <clears throat> we can open it up now to the audience. Uh, if you would, please identify yourself when you ask your question. And there are mics that are coming around. So um, why don't we start here on this side? Yeah, it's working. Uh, my name is Raphael. I work with Build a Movement, uh, an organization who uh, train activists around the world on the methods of nonviolent uh, activism and civil disobedience. Um, so everything that you talk about is very relevant to what we do. Um, and I w I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, Burkina Faso. I think that in the past few years, it's been the most interesting case for us as trainers and as uh, uh, observers of civil society uh, in, in terms of the, the mass movement that led to the coup in 2014 and also the ma mass movement that defeated the second coup in 2015. So I just wanted to hear a little bit your thought about this particular case and how that informed your research. Well, to be frank, Burkina Faso is one of the three cases we haven't analyzed yet. So I'm not sure if I can really say some, if I have the, uh, the, the necessary in-depth knowledge to comment on Burkina Faso specifically. But what we see, Burkina Faso is a rather exceptional case for two reasons. First of all, it led to, military, to a military coup, and the military coup then failed to institutionalize a new authoritarian regime. My understanding of the case of uh, Burkina Faso, and this is really based just on what I've studied so far, uh, my understanding is that this is mainly a consequence of two factors, or oh, two sets of factors. One factor is the dismissal state of the Burkina Faso and armed forces, which are not a professional military organization, which are, uh, uh, which, uh, which exhibit a high degree of factionalism, intramilitary conflicts, which and, and military unity is a, a very important, a key condition for successful military coups. Though uh, that might explain, might be one important reason, uh, one major reason why the military, although it staged the coup, failed really then to take over power. And second, and uh, there I would like, love to hear more from you, is uh, obviously the tactics, the organizational techniques used by the opposition movement. I have to study that more uh, in more depth and in depth. Okay, I think we had one, yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for an extremely interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Aaron Koreva, I'm from the McCain Institute. Uh, from one case that you probably did not study to another case you probably did not study, which is Russia. Uh, I mean, of course, it's not the same thing. Uh, but, you know, there is a history of what happened in 91. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking about, for example, the National Guard, the fact that you have, you know, Kadyrov's people in Moscow. Now, I just want to hear your thoughts about that and what that is a sign of, if you have any. Thank you. Okay, Russia is an extremely fascinating case. As you said, uh, unfortunately, not in our sample. Oh population of cases because there never was an end game. But uh, there might be a reason for that, that there never was an end game. And it's an extremely fascinating case for a student of civil military relations for two reasons. First, there was the 1991 coup. That was in 1991, the failed coup against Gorbachev. That's an extremely interesting case because it demonstrated what, in my understanding, what most of the uh, communist uh, studies, uh, East European studies guys would have predicted anyway. Socialist party militaries do not engage in coup making, except for nine, at least not in, in established uh, 
uh, a communist party regimes, not these countries like Angola and Mozambique, which called themselves socialist, but were pre pretty much rentier uh, and kleptocratic systems, right? Uh, so these militaries do not engage in, in coup making. There is no history of coup making in such countries. And the military usually was under the communist rule. But please correct me if, if, if you back to differ from my uh, statement, uh, in these regimes, the military usually did not play a major role in internal security and regime security. They had their thugs, their organizations, their intelligence services, their security agencies. So that's first uh, uh, very interesting. 91 basically demonstrated, and the outcome of the failed coup may have also uh, shown to military officers in the Soviet Union and in Russia then why it's actually a good idea not to engage in coup making. Second then, with regard to Russia today, as I understand, but I'm not a Russian a Russia expert, uh, Putin's pretty, or, or the government of the Federation of Russia is pretty much doing that what Arab dictators used to do in the 1980s and 1990s, counterbalancing establishing a whole number, a large number, a whole series of different security organizations which balance each other and reduce by this the likelihood of a military coup or some other form of insider coup. So uh, what would that then mean, uh, predicting or, or informed guesses? Uh, what would that mean for uh, military reactions in a potential Russian endgame? Well, as I understand uh, the military, but we would first have to ask, is the Russian military involved in human rights violations? Is it a main perpetrator of atrocities and human rights violations in Russia? My answer would be, yeah, to some extent, yes, but uh, no, mostly it's not the military uh, which acts against opposition or civil society or other organizations. Second, is there military unity? Well, I would say that is something the Russia experts have to tell us, have to decide. But I would ask, how, how coherent is the Russian military? Is it coherent enough to organize a coup? Third, much would depend on the diversity and the distance, uh, diversity of the protest movement and the distance between the protest movement and the military. And fourth, is Putin engaging in a script of selection? Is he nominating members of his own hometown, region, religious group, ethnicity to top senior positions of the military? Probably not. But those were the questions I would then ask and analyze in order to understand how probable, how likely would be military repression, loyalty shift, or uh, a military coup. Bottom line is, I would assume probably they stay at home, the military, not, not these other guys in the security apparatus. OK, um, here in the front, there's a, there's a microphone, why don't you? Hello, I'm Tara O. Oh. Pacific Forum CSIS, and I think I have maybe similar question, but replace the country with North Korea. Mm -hmm. Again, another country without end game. Would you say something similar, or is there something slightly different from the Russian case? Yeah, I think the North Korean case is different, although I, I, I know, I, I've studied South Korea, but I've never been to North Korea. And I've only seen once one living North Korean in my life. It was two weeks ago at the DMC. Uh, so uh, that said, well, I think the North Korean case is very is, is surprisingly different from the Russian case. First of all, with regard to ascriptive selection, I mean, we know that the Kim family, the guerrilla dynasty, uh, dominates the senior ranks of the North Korean military and all other um, all other military or security organizations. While it is usually political scientists tend to categorize it as a one-party regime, it's pretty much a personalist dictatorship, right? Run by a family and a clan and a fairly small regime coalition. Though this regime is engaging in a script of selection. I think this is pretty clear from everything I have seen. Is the military involved in atrocities? Yes. Is the military uh, coherent? Po does the military possess sufficient unity to act as a coherent actor? 
That's something which I think is more difficult, a question that is more difficult to answer, that would require more knowledge about this particular military and regime than I actually have, and I think as most scholars have. Uh, but let's assume it is coherent. Then we have ascriptive selection, military unity, military atrocities. That's a recipe for re a repression or coup, not for loyalty shift. So my informed guess would be if there is, for whatever reasons, a nonviolent mass movement in North Korea, I would bet my money on repression or coup and not on loyalty shift. OK, right here. Hi, I'm, I'm Mel Rios from NED. Um, I'll, I'll continue with the uh, cases where there's no end game uh, yet. And, <laughs> but um, so recently, the Trump administration has, re has uh, announced or, or rolled uh, sanctions targeting the uh, Cuban military or entity, economic entities owned by the Cuban, uh, Cuban armed forces. Uh, in your opinion, or based on the on your on your research, uh, is that a an effective policy prescription to sort of turn the military into an enabler of a potential democratic transition, or when a the possibility of a transition comes, um, is that a way to turn the military from a a blocker of uh, of, the, of that process to an enabler of that process? Is sanctions uh, the way, or if not, what is it? What is the way to bring democratic change to Cuba? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I would like to know the answer. Um, well, uh, I, but I think we have to differentiate, uh, distinguish between two questions. What would be the what could be the effect of economic sanctions on the likelihood of an insider coup in Cuba. So some parts, segments of the regime elite and the military is the key factor in Cuba uh, and also in the Cuban economy. Uh, that's one aspect. The second aspect is would sanctions have an impact, an effect on military reactions to uh, nonviolent mass mobilization? Um, with regard to the second factor, you know, well, these sanctions are obviously not targeted to trigger mass mobilization because they affect very much the regime elite in particular, right? So uh, I'm not sure if these sanctions are an appropriate instrument or tool to mobilize or increase the ability of Cuban population to mobilize against the regime. I, I think this is not very plausible to me. Is it in, if, it, might it be in a effective, a smart three-dimensional chess instrument to trigger um, uh, intra-elite conflicts and an insider coup? That's actually an interesting question uh, because uh, these sanctions, sanctions would, as I understand, uh, especially affect, negatively affect the military because of its economic consequences uh, and uh, military business uh, interests in Cuba. That's an interesting question. Could that lead to uh, an insider coup? Well, I'm not so sure if that really is then the, would then be the case, because what would a Cuban military officer have to get from democratic change in Cuba? Economically? Probably not so much. So I, I'm not sure if it's an effective instrument to increase the probability of insider coups in Cuba, or that it is an effective instrument to increase the likelihood of mass mobilization against Raul Castro. Okay, we seem to have a number of questions and comments. Why don't we take a few? So we have here, Turgut here, and Mark also. I was wondering about the 
the uh, how the role of the military changes if it's actually engaged in war or has recently been engaged in war does it make it more probable to uh to take charge and to think that they are more capable to run the country than the existing civilian government or you know in general what do you think about the role uh, of the military that has recently been at war or currently engaged in it thank you you mean interstate war interstate war yeah so not not, not in, inside the country war. but like with with other countries let's say yeah. this is a very interest oh sorry 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 and let's so go many to this gentleman questions. here yes <laughs> For an interesting presentation, Bill Veal, I'm a retired foreign service officer. I wanted to ask if you would apply your analytical matrix to China uh, yeah. as well. Okay, and Mark here in the front. Uh, Mark Plattner, Journal of Democracy. I know you don't like to speculate, but you're good at it. So, uh, <laughs> um, Let me ask about the chart earlier in your, in your presentation that had traditional coups declining and uh, political changes due to mass mobilization ascending. So my first question is how you explain that and the real speculation then the second is, is that a pattern that's likely to continue or do you think it's one that might be, uh, be reversed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, the 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 uh, shortest answer is the is the answer to the or reply is uh, is the reply to the second question. Yes, we have China in our sample, and yes, I uh, at least one of one of uh, one member of our team is a China expert. So we could try to uh, use this framework to produce informed guesses or predictions about not the likelihood of mass mobilization in China, but the likelihood of specific reactions of the military to such mass mobilization. So short answer is yes. Uh, I would assume okay, uh, but uh, and, and, and I, I go into the detail if we have more time after I've replied to the first and third question. Uh, the first question, Turgut, that's a very interesting question, but, uh, well, for one, it's difficult to answer because despite the rhetoric of most governments around the globe, militaries in the 21st century or after World War II hardly engage in interstate war. There are only very few militaries, Soviet Union, United States, France, Britain, Israel, of the 193 states around the world, 170, 168, something like that, have a military. And of these, let's say 165, not more than 20, or at most 25, have been involved in interstate war in a, in, 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 in a, in, as, a, as a serious uh, uh, a threat and in combat engagement for the military. So not these Afghanistan missions, which is not interstate war, but some kind of peace building, peacekeeping, counterinsurgency war, but not traditional in interstate war. So that's difficult to say how that actually affects the military, because so few militaries were ever involved after 1945 in interstate war. But there is one, f one argument which I find plausible, in, not in the research on, um, on mass mobilizations, but in general in the research on civil military relations, that external threats are actually have a positive, can have a positive impact on civilian control, especially in democracies. That's the Michael Dash hypothesis, the structural theory, uh, that uh, argues, and it's less will, and to some extent also hunting nothing. Uh, the basic argument is if there is an existential, a serious military threat from a neighboring country or, or well, nuclear, uh, potential for nuclear war, something like that, civilians will actually care about military policy, about defense policy. They develop an interest and they have an incentive to develop civilian institutions of military control. If there is no external threat, civilians don't care much about that. And 
the military often then focuses on internal missions. That's the South America, Latin America experience, except for the football war, which was actually no war between El Salvador and Honduras in the early 1980s. There never was an uh, international war, uh, interstate war in Latin America since the early 20th century. And uh, the, um, the question by Mark, yeah, that's, um, well, mm, why, how do we explain this uh, this trend of increasing in, increasing number of leader access through to mass mobilization and declining number of leader access due to military coups. Mm, I would like to propose a number of hypotheses. Uh, the first hypothesis would be, well, the declining number of leader access due to coups uh, is simply a result of the uh, declining number of military coups in general. Uh, so, uh, what explains the decrease in the number of military coups? One reason is, I think, that uh, since the end of the Cold War, the early 1990s, it has become more difficult for militaries in authoritarian regimes and in new democracies to legitimize military coups at least until, let's say, 2000, 2005. Tides may change now again with the rise of China and Russia and uh, the, the uh, debates about Western support for democracy and democratization. So the declining number of military coups, which, which reflect changes in the international environment, also uh, many countries that had experienced military coups in the past experience in the past 20, 30 years economic growth. And one of the findings in the research on military coups is that the more developed, the higher uh, economic development is, the less likely it is that the military will stage a coup. Uh, the increasing number of mass mobilization, well, we have lots of research out there about the reasons for mass mobilization. Much has to do with, uh, and this is pretty much a phenomenon of, let's say, 85 to 2005 more or less. Uh, and much has to do with contagion effects, demonstration effects, diffusion effects, learning effects between different countries within regions. And here now comes my second hypothesis. If I read the literature on authoritarian regimes and how they learn and react to, let's say, color revolutions, Arab uprisings, people power movements in various parts, they actually try to prove their own rule against diffusion. Diffusion of mass protests from one country to other countries. So that would make uh, that that would me lead to the hypothesis that the declining number of coups, insider coups, will continue, but the number of leader exits due to mass mobilization will also might also decrease, which overall would mean that leader exits become less frequent. Authoritarian rule might become more stable. Okay, we should probably wrap up, but we have time for a few more questions or comments from the audience. So if there's, I see there's one in the back and um, there's another one here. Why don't we take these last two and then you can respond to that and offer final remarks. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Norris from the NED. Uh, I have a question about your sort of uh, model of the dictator, uh, sorry. I have a question about your model of the dictator's endgame, uh, specifically so the way that you construct it, it's when the security forces are overwhelmed and the, the military is the last line of defense. And so when you, when you put it that way, it seems like it'd be foolish for any dictator to put their faith mostly in the security forces when they get to the dictator's endgame and the military uh, is all that stands between them and exit. Um, but I wonder if the reason for that is because all of the cases in which the mass protest is put down by the security forces are absent from the model. So, so what is it that makes you uh, make the the military the determinative factor in the dictator's endgame? Okay, and there was another question here in the aisle. Yes, uh, I'm Brian Marshall, and I've um, <clears throat> been serving on a number of long-term observer missions with OSCE and also uh, uh, on temporary one-year appointments overseas with the State Department. But um, in any case, 
there seem to be a developing number of attacks on journalists uh, these days. Do you see, how do you see the implications of this situation? Okay. Uh, well, first question. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We have a uh, censored sample that includes only those cases in which either the non-military internal security agencies were not called up or failed to uh, contain the protest. So I'm not able to answer your question uh, because this is not part of our research to analyze why, an end, why a protest movement leads to an end game. That's basically your question, right? Uh, we, we selected existing end games, but Unfortunately, there's lots of research out there that deals with this question. When do protests become uh, an existential threat to authoritarian regimes? Like Chenoweth and Stevens' book on nonviolent rep revolutions. I'm not so sure if the statistical results are really so robust uh, as they, they, they claim they are, or Sharon Napstadt's work, uh, or Court Schock's work on this. And it, uh, well, um, the, the domain, I, I think in a perfect world, in a perfect world for dictators, uh, fortunately we are not living in a perfect world for dictators, <laughs> uh, in a perfect world the dictator would probably make sure that protests do not happen because if protests don't take place, there is no risk of containment failure, and there is no need for the dictator to rely on the military. In general, I think it makes sense for dictators to rely primarily on non-military security forces. Why is that? There is a, there, I think there is, uh, among others, one crucial difference between police and intelligence services on the one hand, and military on the other hand. I know there are these, these paramilitary troops like in Russia of the Ministry of Interior, which are de facto military troops, but not under military uh, command. I, I'm aware of that, so I'm, it's kind of stylist uh, narrative. Why does it make for military? Because these police officers, these paramilitary militia guys, these intelligence officers, at the end of the day, at 6 p.m., they go home. They go home, they live in a civilian neighborhood usually. They are not part of a very closed organization like the military. So for police, intelligence services, it's very difficult to actually conduct a kind of a military or police coup against an authoritarian leader. They are not as coherent, they are less, uh, they have more problems to solve coordination problems. So for the dictator, it makes sense to rely primarily on non-military uh, security force. But in a not so perfect world, the military, uh, the dictator may then face the dilemma that he needs a strong military as the weapon of last resort, last line of defense, but at the same time, to have a military that is able, effective, efficient enough to put down the protests means also establishing or creating some form of threat to his rule. Well, that's life. You live in dilemmas, right, as a dilemmata. <laughs> same in democracies. Uh, and uh, the other question with the, with the journalists. Uh, I, I've never done any research. Sorry, I'm always focusing on, on soldiers. Uh, I haven't done any research on, on journalists. I'm not able to answer that question or to say anything that goes beyond Washington Post and New York Times. <laughs> and this is, uh, okay, I'm not saying anything. So. Well, in a perfect world, we would have a lot more time for Aurel to respond to many other of these queries. Uh, I think it's been tremendously illuminating, and um, I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Aurel Croissant for his presentation today, and thank you for coming. Thank you.